Hey everybody, welcome to tutorial 15. In the next three videos, we're going to have a close look at composing and performing a piece of music in Super Collider using excerpted code from one of my own compositions as an example. In the first two of these three videos, we'll focus on composition strategies for creating interesting sound, and in the third video, we'll incorporate these sounds into a performance-oriented code structure in which the piece can be performed and modified quickly and easily. I've chosen this topic because I often see new users pick up the basics of Super Collider very quickly, but it can be much more challenging to make the jump from scattered, unorganized bits of code to a more sophisticated and robust means of performance. Keep in mind that what you see in these videos is my own personal approach that I've been developing over the years. It's an approach that I've found useful and reliable, but it's not the absolute correct way to do things. There are lots of different approaches that work well, and, and that's part of the beauty of the Super Collider platform. So let's begin with composition, which, for me, almost always begins with building synth defs. And one of the synth defs from this piece that I was most happy with outputs a bandpass filtered sawtooth wave, which, all things considered, is a very straightforward concept. But there are a few enhancements I like to include that help make the synth def more versatile, and I'll highlight these enhancements as we go. For the basic ugen function, we have a sawtooth wave with a frequency input sent through a bandpass filter with controls for center frequency and reciprocal quality, and then we output the signal. In many cases, including this one, we also want to include an envelope generator so we can shape the amplitude of the sound over time. And of course we need to start with an argument declaration and provide sensible default values. The default output sounds like this. So over the course of this video, we'll be looking at a variety of techniques that can help transform a relatively simple sound into a more complex and interesting sound. And one such technique is iteration. In the following example, we use do to iterate over a collection of four MIDI note numbers converted to cycles per second. And for each number in the array, we use an argument declaration to pass that value into a function which creates a synth and uses that input value for the frequency of the synth. And since we'll have four instances, it makes sense to lower the amplitude to avoid clipping. By generating random numbers for argument values within an iterative function, the output of each synth is unique. Here, the center frequency of the filter ranges between the first and twelfth partial, and each of the four bandpass filters has a uniquely generated quality as well. Each time this code is evaluated, we hear resonance at different parts of the frequency spectrum. There's lots of opportunity for experimentation here. If we want to embrace randomness even more, we can create four synths, but completely ignore the values being passed into the function. You might find some use for the scale object, which is an abstract representation of a musical scale. In fact, lots of pre-built scale instances are readily available, like major, minor, chromatic, and you can see the complete list with scale.directory, and more information in the scale help file. After choosing a scale, Degrees converts to an array of integer scale degrees. Then, using simple addition, we can transpose the scale degrees to a more sensible range, in this case a natural minor scale beginning on middle C, convert to cycles per second, and choose a random scale degree each time the function is called. With each full evaluation, we hear four pitches from a C minor scale, and duplicate pitches are possible. Using scale and choose is a nice way to strike a balance between deterministic pitches and complete randomness. Even the number of synths we generate can be randomized. Remember that this syntax shortcut gives us the array of integers from 1 to 6. So now whenever we evaluate, we choose one of these integers and produce that many synths. 
And conveniently, we can also see this value in the post window. Before we go any further, let's return to our synth def to make some improvements. In the examples we just heard, the random values chosen for synth arguments don't continuously vary over the course of the synth duration. Instead, they remain fixed at their initially chosen value. But we can change this by using low frequency noise generators to autonomously vary one or more of the input arguments. So to start, let's multiply the fundamental frequency by an instance of LF noise 1. And this will allow us to dynamically detune the fundamental. A frequency of 0.5 means we choose a new random value once every two seconds. LF noise 1 normally ranges between positive and negative 1, but we want it to range between a positive and negative detune value. We can of course use the range method, which we've seen many times, but the bipolar method is a more convenient way of doing the same thing. But using even fewer characters, we can take advantage of the fact that the default output is minus 1 to positive 1. And therefore, we can specify detune as the mull argument, thereby scaling the output by the detune value. I'm imagining detune as a value in semitones, so to make this work as a frequency multiplier, we need to use MIDI ratio to convert semitones to frequency ratios. So with the default value of 0.2, the detuning effect is fairly weak, since we're only detuning by a fifth of a half step in either direction, which is not very much. But we really start to notice the effect if we create multiple instances, because each synth has its own independent noise generator, which results in irregular frequency beating. And with even more instances, we get a sort of chorus effect. Notice that if we want to disable the detuning effect altogether, we don't have to revert to an earlier version of the synth def. Instead, we can just specify zero for the detune argument. And of course, we also have the option of a larger detune value, which creates a meandering pitch cluster effect. Let's do something similar for the center frequency and quality. I am being a little arbitrary with these frequency values here. My only consideration is that I want to choose random values at a relatively slow rate. So 0.2 and 0.1 are reasonable choices, but I'm not choosing them for any specific reason. We also need to make sure we include these new arguments in our declaration. I'm specifying default values that are sensible, but again, not chosen for any particular reason. So here's what our synth def sounds like with 10 instances, each with a fundamental of 50 hertz. Let's continue experimenting and have the center frequency vary between the second and fiftieth partial. If we specify a reciprocal quality range relatively close to one, thereby lowering the quality of the filter, the filtering effect is weakened and we hear something that more closely resembles the original detuned sawtooth wave. But if these values are close to zero, we increase filter quality and therefore strengthen the filtering effect. In this case, we can still perceive a 50 hertz fundamental, but we also hear strong sweeping resonances at random points throughout the harmonic series. Now I'd like to turn our attention to spatialization, because, as you may have noticed, we're still dealing with a monophonic signal. One of the simplest options with a mono signal is to add a pan position argument and an instance of pan 2 near the end of the synth def. Zero corresponds to the center of the stereo space. And with something like 0.7, all 10 synths are panned heavily towards the right channel. 
and in this case, each synth has a random pan position, giving us a richer stereophonic experience. A simple alternative for creating stereo sound is to invoke multi-channel expansion using the duplication shortcut exclamation point two. This creates an array of two copies, which the server interprets by writing these signals to consecutive output channels. We can see and hear that output channels 0 and 1 contain the exact same signal. There are several other spots in the synthtef where we could alternatively place exclam2, such as after the envelope, after the sawtooth wave, or after the bandpass filter, and these choices would all have the same signal copying effect. In tutorial 5, however, we saw that functions delineated by an enclosure of curly braces respond differently to duplication. As a quick review, duplicating a random process results in an array containing copies of the randomly generated value. But duplicating a function, regardless of what it contains, causes the function to be reevaluated each time it's duplicated. So when that function contains random processes, we get uniquely generated results with each copy. Let's apply this technique to our synth def. If we duplicated our noise generators without enclosing them in curly braces, the result is an exact copy of the noise generator output. So, once again in this case, we have identical signals in both output channels. But enclose our noise generators in curly braces before multi-channel expansion, and each noise generator copy outputs a unique random signal, which we can see clearly in the level meters. Now if we want to pan this signal left and right, we can't use pan2, because pan2 expects one monophonic input signal. Instead, a good choice here is a UGen called balance2, which treats two monophonic inputs as left and right channels, adjusts their amplitudes according to a pan argument, and outputs a combined stereo signal. Because we've multi-channel expanded our signal, it's actually an array of two signals, so we can refer to the individual monophonic signals by specifying sig at 0 for the left channel and sig at 1 for the right channel. Here's hard left, hard right, and center. Pan2 and Balance2 are slightly different, but both very solid choices for simple stereo spatialization. Now, arguably, it's sort of rare to be dealing with multi-channel signals with more than two channels, but it's definitely not unheard of. And even though we can't get the full effect in this video, I want to briefly show an approach for spatializing more than two audio channels. First things first, we need to increase the number of SuperCollider's hardware output channels and reboot the server for this change to take effect. And we'll also reopen the level meters. I'm going to return our signal to a monophonic state and introduce a UGen called Pan AZ, which is short for azimuth panner. An azimuth panner assumes the user is in the middle of a circular formation of an arbitrary number of equidistantly spaced loudspeakers and allows us to position a monophonic signal somewhere within this ring of speakers. By default, Pan AZ assumes the front of the listening space is a pair of speakers that the left front speaker corresponds to output zero, and that the output indices increase as we move clockwise around the ring. The first argument is the number of output channels. Let's imagine we have eight speakers. Next, the monophonic input signal, and then the pan position. Like pan2 and balance2, pan az expects a value between plus and minus one, but interprets this value differently. A position of zero corresponds to front and center. As this value goes from 0 to negative 1, the sound moves from front to back around the left side. As we go from 0 to positive 1, the sound moves from front to back along the right side. And so one thing I really like about Pan AZ is that it doesn't matter how many speakers you actually have. You only need to specify the circular position of the sound, and Pan AZ figures out the rest. So here we have 10 instances with a few arbitrary arguments. 
A pan value of zero puts the sound front and center, so on the meter window it appears in outputs zero and one. Because a pan position of zero is front and one is rear, then a pan position of 0.25 is 45 degrees to the right of front center. So we see signal in channels one and two. A pan position of 0.5 is directly to the right of the listener. So in this theoretical octophonic setup, we see level in channels two and three. A value of either 1 or negative 1 produces signal in the rear of the listening space in channels 4 and 5, and so forth. We can't modulate the number of channels, but we can modulate the pan position. A low frequency sawtooth wave provides an oscillating ramp from minus 1 to positive 1, so it's perfect for simulating a sound source moving in circles around the listener. Other UGENs make for interesting spatial effects as well. For example, LF Noise 1 outputs random linear ramp segments, so it makes the output sound like it's moving randomly around the listening space. For clarity, let's just listen to one instance while watching the level meters. With 10 synths, each has a unique random spatialization. It's disappointing that we can't hear this sound in its true octophonic glory, but I hope you'll take my word for it that this kind of thing sounds great when you're lucky enough to have the hardware at your disposal. So for now, let's return to the stereo version with multi-channel expansion and balance too. All right, next I want to talk about nested randomness. In other words, controlling some aspect of a random process with another random process. Now for me, the appeal of random eugens like LF noise is that they help make sound less predictable, which in turn can make sound more interesting to listen to. But nesting random eugens can really enrich this effect. I want to start with a very simple example of what I'm talking about. So here we have a sine wave. Modifying like so, we control the frequency of the sine wave with a non-interpolating noise generator, LF noise zero. The frequency of the sine wave randomly varies between 200 and 800, but the frequency of the noise generator does not. It's fixed at a constant 8 values per second, and you can actually hear that 8 hertz rhythm very clearly. But let's go one level deeper and control the frequency of the noise generator with another noise generator. the sound becomes even less predictable. Not only does the frequency of the sine wave randomly vary, but the rate at which the frequency changes is now also random. Now, I totally realize that the code for this kind of technique looks objectively confusing. And even if we space this code onto multiple lines with multiple variables, it can still be considerably challenging to conceptualize what's actually going on here. So even though it is possible to continue this nesting process inward and inward and inward, I pretty much always stop here, mostly for the sake of my own sanity. So let's take this nesting idea and apply it to the bandpass filter's center frequency. For added flexibility, I'll add two new arguments to control the minimum and maximum output of the nested noise generator, which will determine the minimum and maximum speed at which the center frequency can vary. The previous example used a constant frequency value of 0.2, so I'm choosing a default range of 0.1 and 0.3 to keep from drastically changing the default sound. Here's how it sounds so far. If we increase the overall range of the nested noise generator, let's say from 1 to 6 hertz, the center frequencies will change more quickly and the resonant sweeping effects will become faster and more prominent. We're already dealing with a pretty wide frequency range, the second partial to the 50th partial, and the filter quality is pretty high as well. So in this case, if we increase these range values even more, the filter resonance becomes so strong and so fast that the fundamental starts to disappear altogether and the sound starts to transform into sort of a bubbly texture. 
in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here with nested randomness. However, I do encourage you to continue experimenting at home. But remember that your ears are a precious commodity, and SuperCollider will not protect you if you accidentally type an extra zero or forget a decimal point. So if you ever feel like you're starting to lose your conceptual grasp on what exactly you're doing, for your health, first take the headphones off, turn down the computer volume, and always keep an eye on the level meters. Okay, we're at the point where the synth def in this video is almost identical to the version I used in my own work. The last thing I want to add is a low shelf filter. In the original composition, I added this because there were times when I wanted the option to boost or attenuate a certain range of low frequencies, so I'm including it here as well. Notice I'm setting the default decibel value to zero, so if we don't specify otherwise when we create a synth, we are essentially bypassing the low shelf filter. Right, so with this synth def in its final form, we're ready to turn our attention to more techniques for creating larger and more interesting composite musical gestures. As a starting point, let's imagine we want to create a chord progression. And I think using patterns, p-bind in particular, is one of the best ways to do this. So here we'll be revisiting some ideas from tutorial 10. Setting the door key to a fixed value of 2 gives us a new event every 2 seconds. And I'll also provide some fixed values for a few other parameters. For the frequency pattern, pseq is a good choice for a fixed sequence of values. But an array of integers like this gives us a melodic progression with a single pitch for each event. To instead create a chord progression, we can provide pseq with an array containing other arrays. In this case, the first generated event uses the array 23, 35, 54, 63, 64 with the MIDI note key. And the first event results in the creation of five synths, one for each MIDI note. The next event uses the next subarray, which corresponds to the next chord, and so forth. I'm also going to extend the time aspects of this pattern so that we can savor these chords a little bit more. If instead we want these chords to be in a less predictable order, we can replace pseq with something else, such as pxrand, which chooses randomly from a collection, but never repeats the same choice twice in a row. And for the sake of variety, I'll also add uh, a fourth subarray so that we have four chords to choose from. Now you might notice that MIDI note is the only finite pattern within this p-bind. pxrand chooses one array and then stops. Everything else in this p-bind is a single symbol or number, which are interpreted as infinite length patterns. So because pxrand generates only one value, the enclosing p-bind generates only one event. But if we replace this one with inf, then all internal patterns are infinite, and these chords will play on forever, which means we should definitely give it a name so that we can stop it later. And also, let's not forget that we have a huge pattern library at our disposal. So for fun and for variety, let's throw a few more patterns into the mix.
Now, here's a surprising twist. We can use this synth diff to create an entirely different type of sound just by specifying a few unusual argument values, and without having to make any changes to the synth diff itself. So far we've been specifying frequency values that the human ear perceives as having a distinct pitch, roughly 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. But remember that we're dealing with a sawtooth wave, so listen to what happens when the frequency drops below 20 hertz. With low frequency values like this, we don't stop hearing sound altogether. We just stop perceiving pitch and instead start perceiving the rhythm of the individual sawtooth cycles. But having a low frequency doesn't make our sawtooth wave any less spectrally rich, so we can still use the bandpass filter to draw out certain frequencies from these individual clicks. First, let's raise the quality of the filter. We can hear these clicks start to resonate at specific pitches, as determined by the center frequency of the bandpass filter. The resonant pitches themselves are moving around because, recall, our bandpass center frequency is controlled by a noise generator. But we can set these range values equal to one another in order to fix the center frequency at a constant value, in this case 880 hertz. So, the next thing to do is start thinking of creative ways to take this synth and use it to construct larger and more complex ideas. So let's start building another pattern to create multiple instances like this one. Starting on the more random side of things, random delta time, random frequency, and uh, we'll set the center frequency minimum and maximum far apart from one another to allow the resonant pitches to wander up and down. But if we want to bring back our original idea of fixed resonant frequencies, we need the center frequency minimum and maximum to be equal. And for this we can use the P key pattern to copy the value from a previous key to make sure that CF max is always equal to whatever is generated for CF min. Although we hear a variety of pitches, each individual synth is fixed at one particular frequency. Let's suppose we want these pitches to be consistent with the pitches from our chord progression from earlier. In this case, here's an opportunity to reuse the scale object. So here we create an array of MIDI notes of an E major scale, convert to cycles per second, and use P rand to choose a random pitch. Patterns understand mathematical operations like addition, subtraction, and much more, so transposing these pitches is pretty easy. Since this P rand outputs values in cycles per second, we can just multiply by another P rand that outputs octave transposition ratios. In this case, the selected pitches can be one octave lower, stay the same, or be one or two octaves higher. To make the rhythmic aspects more regular, 
we get rid of these two px brands and replace them with more deterministic choices. In this case, a new synth every second or half second. And the rhythm of each sawtooth wave will be chosen from a random collection of low values with close arithmetic relationships. The slowest rhythm will be one percussive articulation every two seconds, and the fastest it can be is eight per second. And I'll also lengthen the amplitude envelope for each synth. Let's imagine we want to detune these frequencies. We don't actually adjust the detune value for this because the detune value affects the fundamental frequency. So adjusting detune would actually slightly speed up or slow down the perceived rhythm. Instead, it's the center frequency that controls the perceived frequency. So that's the value we want to modify. Specifically, we'll just multiply the maximum center frequency by some random value slightly larger than one so that there's a bit of wiggle room for the center frequencies to move around. You might find this effect to be pretty subtle, but you should be able to hear that the scale degrees are now just slightly out of tune with one another. And just to demonstrate how the detune argument actually behaves in this particular case, here you'll notice that when detune deviates away from zero, we no longer have perfect rhythmic synchronization between simultaneous synths. And for the final touch, let's play these two patterns simultaneously. That's it for tutorial 15. Generally speaking, these are the sorts of techniques I'll often use when I'm composing a piece or experimenting with sound in Super Collider. I hope this video gives you some ideas for your own work or just helps shed some light on the process. In the next video, we'll continue with composition by creating a couple more synth thefts. One of these synth thefts will deal with buffer playback, accompanied by some useful buffer management strategies. And we'll also create a homemade reverb synth def and use it to start putting together a small chain of effects on the audio server. And in the video after that, we'll start putting all the pieces together into something that can be easily performed and edited. So as always, thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.